To all things you must try to be, a sister and a brother. Take them into you and see that one thing is another. No star shall fall, no leaf hang low, nor shall you fail in vain. With all these things you undergo a change and rise again. Show me a man anywhere in the whole wide world who knows and loves clouds more than I, or show me anything more beautiful. They are a plaything and a comfort to the eye, a blessing and a gift of God. They also contain wrath and the power of death. They assume the shapes of blessed isles and guardian angels, resemble threatening hands, fluttering sails, migrating cranes. They hover between God's heaven and the poor earth like beautiful likenesses of man's every yearning and partake of both realms. Dreams of the earth in which the solid soul cleaves to the pure heaven above. They are the eternal symbol of all voyaging, of every quest and yearning for home. And as the clouds are suspended faint-heartedly and longingly and stubbornly between heaven and earth, the souls of men are suspended faint-heartedly and longingly and stubbornly between time and eternity. O oh, lovely floating, restless clouds, I was an ignorant child and loved them, watched them, little knowing that I would drift through life like a cloud, voyaging, everywhere a stranger, hovering between time and eternity. Each phenomenon on earth is an allegory, and each allegory is an open gate through which the soul, if it is ready, can pass into the interior of the world where you and I and day and night are all one. Everyone is sometimes assailed by the thought that everything visible is an allegory and that behind the allegory lives spirit and eternal life. Few, to be sure, pass through the gate and give up the beautiful illusion for the surmised reality of what lies within. I'd love to play the violin, but I wouldn't know where to begin. To learn piano could take me years. But whistling is music to my ears. Well, I'm no master, nothing of the sort. Art is long and life is short. Still, I'd say my little fife has brightened up my dreary life. The world may not be listening, but I'll just keep on whistling. I don't give a toot, you see, for the world, for you, or even me. I was born toward the end of modern times, shortly before the return of the Middle Ages. I was the child of pious parents whom I loved tenderly and would have loved even more tenderly if I had not very early been introduced to the fourth commandment. Unfortunately, commandments have always had a disastrous effect on me, however right and well meant they may be. 
Though by nature a lamb and docile as a soap bubble, I have always behaved rebelliously toward commandments of every sort, especially during my youth. All I needed to hear was, thou shalt, and everything in me rose up, and I became obdurate. It's true that our teachers taught us in that amusing subject called world history, that the world has always been governed, guided, and transformed by men who made their own laws and broke with traditional regulations. And we were told that these men should be revered. But this was just as deceitful as all the rest of our instruction. For when one of us, whether with good or bad intent, summoned up courage to protest against some order or against some silly custom or way of doing things, he was neither revered nor commended as an example, but punished instead, made fun of, and crushed by the teacher's dastardly use of their superior power. Jesus was 12 years old when he shamed the doctors in the temple. We all of us at the age of 12 shamed our doctors and teachers. We were more intelligent than they, more inspired than they, more courageous than they. The older I became, and the staler the small satisfactions I found in my life began to taste, the more it became clear to me where I had to seek for the source of joy in life. I learned that to be loved is nothing, to love, however, all. And more and more I thought I saw that what makes our existence worthwhile and delightful is nothing more than our feelings and sensibility. Happiness is love, nothing more. He who can love is happy. There is no duty to love, only a duty to be happy. And for that alone are we on this earth. One rarely makes others happy with duty, morality, or commandments since one does not make oneself happy with such things. If man can be good, he can be only if he is happy, if he is in harmony with himself, that is, when he loves. This was the teaching, the only teaching of the world. Jesus said it, Buddha said it, Hegel said it. For every man, the sole matter of importance in the world is his own innermost being, his soul, his capacity for love. If that is in order, he may eat millet or cakes, wear rags or jewels, for then the world harmonizes with the soul, is good, is right. The essential, I believe, is not what faith a man has, but that he should have one at all. When it came to his attention, that younger artists had taken to standing on their heads in order to test a new way of seeing things, Meng Hsie immediately undertook this exercise. And after trying it for a while, he said to his disciples, the world strikes me as new and more beautiful when I stand on my head. This story spread. And the innovators among the young artists boasted no little of this confirmation by the old master of their own experiments. As he was known to be a taciturn man who guided his disciples more by his simple presence and example than by teachings, 
each of his pronouncements was carefully noted and widely reported. But then, soon after these words had seduced the young people, even as they had estranged, even angered their elders, yet another of his pronouncements became known. Recently, so it was said, he had expressed himself thus. It is well for man that he has two legs. Standing on one's head is not beneficial to health. And when one resumes the upright, the world looks twice as beautiful as before. The young headstanders, who felt themselves betrayed and scorned, as did the mandarins, were greatly offended by the words of the old master. Today, said the mandarins, Meng Hsia maintains one thing, tomorrow exactly the contrary. Both, however, cannot be true. Who can take the old fellow seriously anymore? It was made known to the master how they spoke of him, the innovators as well as the mandarins. He merely laughed. And as his followers begged him for an explanation, he said, There is a reality, my boys, and nothing will ever change that. But truths, that is, opinions about reality expressed in words, are countless in number, and each is just as true as it is false. No matter how they tried, the disciples could not persuade him to give further explanations. At the lake shore, he went from boat to boat. All were drawn far up on land and fastened tightly with chains. Not until he had wandered far into the city's outskirts did he find one that hung loosely on a rope and could be untied. He cast it loose. Far out in the lake, he drew in the oars. The time had come, and he was content. His little boat, that was it, was his small, limited, artificially guarded life. But the expanse of grayness all around was the world, was the universe and God. It was not hard to let himself drop into that. He sat on the edge of the boat with his feet dangling into the water. Slowly, he leaned forward, leaned forward, until the boat behind him slid briskly away. He was in the universe. Into the small number of moments he continued to live, far more experience was packed than into the 40 years in which he had been on the way to this goal. It began this way. At the moment he fell, when for the fraction of a second he hung between the edge of the boat and the water, it came to him that he was committing suicide. The pathos of wanting to die and the pathos of dying itself coalesced within him. It amounted to nothing. It was all so simple, all so wonderfully easy after all. There were no longer any abysses, any difficulties. The whole trick was to let yourself go. That thought shone through his whole being as the result of his life. Let yourself go. Once you did that, once you had given up, yielded, surrendered, renounced all props and all firm ground underfoot, once you listened solely to the counsel in your own heart, everything was gained. Then everything was good. There was no longer any dread, no longer any danger.
Wonderful thought, a life without dread. To overcome dread, that was bliss, that was redemption. How he had suffered from dread all his life, and now, when death already had him by the throat, he no longer felt it. No dread, no horror, only smiles, release, acceptance. He did not think this as one thinks thoughts. He lived, felt, touched, smelled, and tasted it. He tasted, smelled, saw, and understood what life was. He saw the creation of the world and saw the downfall of the world, like two armies moving in opposite directions, never stopping, eternally on the march. The world was constantly being born and constantly dying. All life was a breath exhaled by God. All dying was a breath inhaled by God. In the gray darkness of the rain above the nocturnal lake, the drowning man saw the drama of the world mirrored and represented. Suns and stars rolled up, rolled down, choirs of men and animals, spirits and angels stood facing one another, sang, fell silent and shouted. His life lay before him like a landscape with woods, valleys and villages that could be viewed from the ridge of a high mountain range. Everything had been good, simple and good, and everything had been converted by his dread, by his resisting to torment and to complexity, to horrible knots and convulsions of wretchedness and grief. There was no woman you could not live without, and there also was no woman with whom you could not have lived. It was blissful to live, it was blissful to die as soon as you hung suspended alone in space. Water flowed into his mouth and he drank. From all sides, through all his senses, water flowed in, everything dissolved in it. He was being drawn, breathed in. Beside him, pressed against him, as close together as the drops of water, floated other people. His wife, his father, his mother and sister, and thousands, thousands, thousands of others. The pictures and buildings as well, Titian's Venus and Strasbourg Cathedral. Everything floated, pressed close together in a tremendous stream, driven by necessity faster and faster rushing madly in this tremendous, gigantic, raging stream of forms, was racing toward another stream just as fast, racing just as fast, a stream of faces, legs, bellies, animals, flowers, thoughts, murders, suicides, written books, wept tears, dense, dense, full, full children's eyes and black curls, and fish heads, a woman with a long, rigid knife in her bloody belly, a young man resembling himself, a face full of holy passion that was himself at the age of 20. How good that this insight too was coming to him now, that there was no time that man is separated from all he craves only by time. By time alone, this crazy invention. The universal stream of forms flowed on, the forms inhaled by God and the other, the contrary forms that he breathed out. Klein saw those who opposed the current, who reared up in fearful convulsions, 
and created horrible tortures for themselves. Heroes, criminals, madmen, thinkers, lovers, religious. He saw others like himself being carried along swiftly and easily in the deep voluptuousness of yielding, of consent. Blessed like himself. Out of the song of the blessed and out of the endless cries of torment from the unblessed, there rose over both universal streams a transparent sphere or dome of sound, a cathedral of music. In its midst sat God, a bright star, invisible from sheer brightness, the quintessence of light, with the music of the universal choirs roaring around in eternal surges. He sang as he floated along in the rushing stream. In the midst of millions, he had become prophet and proclaimer. Loudly his song resounded. The vault of music rose high. Radiantly, God sat within it. The streams roared tremendously along. Occupation was a call he craved to follow through. Thus he neared the lofty elevation of Apollo's sacred retinue. Truly scarce such talent in a poet, so inspired by his own career. Even critics loved him, and to show it, called him Emil, darling dear. Never did this man show deviation, nor from virtue's boundaries ever stray. Sang of God and of a glorious nation, and became the hero of the day. Sadly, though, his heart was not created for this high flight through the soaring cloud, so that on a tour by death ill-fated, he had a stroke and donned his somber shroud. Industry, finance, officials, press, all stood trembling by the open pit. Gerhard Hauptmann then, and Hermann Hess, shoveled heaps of paper into it. With the other specimens and treasures in the public museum's displays, his typewriter is the source of pleasure for people visiting on holidays. Never will his memory lose worth. He's the fatherland's last classicist, perhaps. For indeed, no other man on earth merits more our pride and lowered caps. Even I, inventor of this symbol, even I who lent him fame and face, must adore him now 
ashamed and humble before such talent, such immortal grace. Poke in the eye of piety is one of those acts without which you will never be free of mama's skirts. Friends, we must learn to desist from judging whether the world is good or bad. And we must forgo the strange pretension that it is up to us to better it. The world has often been denounced as bad because the denouncers slept badly or had too much to eat. The world has often been praised as a paradise because the praiser had just kissed a girl. The world wasn't made to be bettered, nor were you made to be bettered. You were made to be yourselves. You were made to enrich the world with a sound, a tone, a shadow. Be yourself, then the world will be rich and beautiful. Now in particular, in these strange times, the song of world betterment is being sung again with a will shouted from the rooftops. Can't you hear how ugly and drunken it sounds? How insensitive, how unhappy, how unintelligent and unwise. And this song is like a frame that can be fitted to any picture. It fitted the Kaiser and the police. This ungainly song fits democracy and socialism and world peace. It fits the abolition of nationalism and the new nationalism as well. Haven't you noticed that wherever this song is struck up, men clench their fists? It is a song of selfishness and self-interest. Apart from Marx's much larger dimensions, the main difference between Marx and me is this. Marx wanted to change the world. I want to change the individual man. He spoke to the masses. I speak to men. The less I am able to believe in our epoch, the less I look to revolution as the remedy, and the more I believe in the magic of love. Sighing, droning through the vaulted room, organ playing. Pensive faithful raptly hear this music, multivoiced in intertwining choirs, yearn, mourn, jubilate with angels, building dwellings for the spirit, gently rock in blessed dream, lay out firmaments of sounding stars. A miracle unequaled, is it not, how note sign covered leaves by interplay of organ pipes transmute to star-spun cosmic choirs which answer to the singly human power of the player at the keys. And listeners who, perceiving this, can glow and soar in sympathy, vibrate, resound, and enter with the music into a pulsing cosmos. This was work harvest of ten generations with a hundred humble masters sowing piously and thousands of disciples.
And as the musician at the organ plays, souls of reverent long departed masters listen midst the arches, held in close embrace by the structure that they join to build. But perfection here below cannot endure. Secretly, as war in every peace, so decay in beauty dwells. Organ playing echoes through the hall. Euphonic sounds call out to new guests. Enter, rest, and pray. Yet, as old tone poems rise again, like buildings o'er the spread of pipes, rich in piety, in wisdom, joy. Outside, much has passed to change both world and souls. Other visitors, another youth have come, to whom half familiar, antique and contorted seems what before was holy and of treasured loveliness. New drives sway their hearts, not to master torturously sternest rules of ancient music men. Quicker challenges impress upon their tribe, war at large and hunger raging. For long do these new guests attend the organ sound, its music true and deep, yet self-contained and safely clothed in sacral dignity. Other sounds they wish and other celebrations, still sensing half ashamed the unwelcome admonition that demands so much in those majestic, lavish organ choirs. Life is short and this is not a time patiently to spend on complicated games. Inside the cathedral of the many who once heard and shared that life, hardly any will remain. One by one they leave, now stooped and older, tired, smaller, chastising the young as traitors, holding bitter silence, then to lie down with the fathers. No one knows if the old master still is playing or if yonder fragile textures hovering in the room might but ghostly echoes be of stubborn spirits from another day. Now and then, a passerby will pause at the cathedral door to listen, nudge it quietly ajar, attend transported to the distant silver stream of music, then to steal away with sound-touched heart. Seek a friend to whisper word of that ethereal hour at the church in the scent of long extinguished candles. Even banished thus into the dark, the sacred stream flows on 
Now and then its ripples rising from the depths as sparkling tones. He who hears them grasps the power of a secret, sees it fleeing, craves to hold it, burns with longing. For he has touched beauty. Even in our estrangement, my wayward brothers, love is still possible for us. Not condemnation nor hatred, but patient love and loving patience brings us to our sacred goal. I will remain by this river, thought Siddhartha. It is the same river which I crossed so long ago. A friendly ferryman took me across. I will go to him. He looked lovingly into the flowing water, into the transparent green, into the crystal lines of its wonderful design. And the river looked at him with a thousand eyes, green, white, crystal, sky blue, how he loved this river, how it enchanted him, how grateful he was to it. In his heart he heard the newly awakened voice speak, and it said to him, Love this river, stay by it, learn from it. Yes, it seemed to him that whoever understood this river and its secrets would understand much more, many secrets, all secrets. Siddhartha stayed with the ferryman and learned. But he learned far more from the river than Vasudeva could teach him. He learned from it continually. Above all, he learned from it how to listen, to listen with a still heart, with a waiting open soul, without passion, without desire, without judgment. He lived happily with Vasudeva, and occasionally they exchanged words, few and long-considered words. Have you, he once asked him, have you also learned that secret from the river, that there is no such thing as time? Yes, Siddhartha, he said. Is this what you mean, that the river is everywhere at the same time, at the source and at the mouth, at the waterfall, at the ferry? at the current, in the ocean, and in the mountains, everywhere, and that the present only exists for it, not the shadow of the past, nor the shadow of the future. That is it, said Siddhartha. And when I learned that, I reviewed my life, and it was also a river. And Siddhartha the boy, Siddhartha the mature man, and Siddhartha the old man, were only separated by shadows, not through reality. Nothing was, nothing will be. Everything has reality and presence. Compelled by a great love and presentiment, Govinda leaned close to him and touched his forehead with his lips. And then something wonderful happened to him. He no longer saw the face of his friend Siddhartha. Instead, he saw other faces, many faces, a long series, a continuous stream of faces, hundreds, thousands, which all came and disappeared and yet all seemed to be there at the same time, faces which continually changed and renewed themselves, and which were yet all Siddhartha. He saw the face of a fish, of a carp, with tremendous, painfully opened mouth, 
a dying fish with dimmed eyes. He saw the face of a newly born child, red and full of wrinkles, ready to cry. He saw the face of a murderer, saw him plunge a knife into the body of a man. At the same moment, he saw this criminal kneeling down, bound, and his head cut off by an executioner. He saw the naked bodies of men and women in the postures and transports of passionate love. He saw corpses stretched out, still, cold, empty. He saw the heads of animals, boars, crocodiles, elephants, oxen, birds. He saw gods. He saw Krishna. He saw all these forms and faces in a thousand relationships to each other, all helping each other, loving, hating, and destroying each other, and becoming newly born. Each one was mortal, a passionate, painful example of all that is transitory. Yet none of them died, they only changed, were always reborn, continually had a new face. And all these forms and faces rested, flowed, reproduced, swam past and merged into each other. And over them all there was continually something thin, unreal, and yet existing, stretched across like thin glass or ice, like a transparent skin, shell, form, or mask of water. And this mask was Siddhartha's smiling face, which Govinda touched with his lips at that moment. And Govinda saw that this mask-like smile, this smile of unity over the flowing forms, this smile of simultaneousness over the thousands of births and deaths, this smile of Siddhartha was exactly the same as the calm, delicate, impenetrable, perhaps gracious, perhaps mocking, wise, thousand-fold smile of Gautama, the Buddha as he had perceived it with awe a hundred times. It was in such a manner, Govinda knew, that the perfect one smiled. in low. The rotten bones are tumbled. On top of one another, crumble. Only his publisher goes on pumping from famous Hess's readers. <laughs> A little something. But I shall come again unto the earth. A likely lad full of mirth. Why the old folks smirk at me, puckered cheeks, benevolently? Oh, guzzle and gob and stuff. I was pious Hesse long enough. With lovely lasses I shall lie, belly to belly and eye to eye. Have my fill and wring their necks until a hangman sends me west. Then my mother could take the pain of giving birth to me again. Fornicate! Far rather would I wait in the shadows, in nothingness, unbegotten, in the beyond, alone, forgotten, untroubled by this world's clashing. Laughing, laughing, laughing! <laughs> <laughs>